Hi guys, we're out here at the Legends and we're asking about the key virtue of joy. Can you tell me what a virtue is? A virtue? Yeah. No, no, I don't. No? No. Okay. Reward. Like patience is a Maybe. virtue. Yes. Like they're good yeah. qualities. Yes. yes. Is, are you pretending to be on the phone so you don't have to answer? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm following you. I'm following you guys. What song brings you the most joy? What song? And you have to sing it. No, that's not gonna oh, happen. Oh, come gonna... on. Do you wanna come talk to me? <laughs> no thanks. Okay, so what's the difference between being joyful and being happy? Happy, happy is like a superficial thing where joy is like not based on your circumstance. Ba based, on, it's not based on emotions. It's based on something deeper. So that was so deep. <laughs> Hello, Westside Family Church. Good to see you today here in the South Sanctuary, the North Sanctuary, or Speedway Campus. Those of you watching online, a particular shout out to Andy and Annabelle who are watching from Machoacan, Mexico. Let's give it up for those guys and everybody that's joining us online or wherever you are at. Uh, in combing through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, uh, we have uncovered what we believe are the top 10 virtues found in the Bible that God wants to see become a part of who you are. And when you study this, you're going to discover, if you're new to the Bible, that most of them are actually contained in one very famous passage of Scripture, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. And we just added hope and humility to come up with the top 10. I want you to take a look at the top 10. Here they are. Love, joy, peace, self-control, hope, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, and humility. This is a beautiful picture of the kind of person that God wants you to become. This is the picture. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says that God says this is your destiny, your predestiny. Even before you were born, he desired for you to be conformed into the image of Christ. Jesus Christ is one who beautifully modeled these virtues before us. Keep your eyes fixed on him and you will experience intense happiness and joy. I say to you over and over again, happiness and joy is not found in money or power. There's nothing wrong with those things, okay? But joy is found in who you're becoming and who you're becoming has everything to do with Jesus Christ. Now I want you to note in Galatians 5 that it's called the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. So I have here a bowl of fruit uh, before me, and the notion or the idea, this is not a, ban a banana that represents joy, and this orange represents self-control, and this pear represents gentleness. It's not the fruits of the Spirit, but rather uh, uh, Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. I don't think this was accidental, but very intentional and instructive. Uh, it is only referring to one piece of fruit. In the Bible, whether it's the Old or New Testament, the fruit that is always talked about is the fruit of the vine or the grape. And so these list of 10 virtues are the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, um, I think the best way to look at this is actually uh, by taking a look at what a, a grape can ultimately become, and that is a glass of wine. Not promoting anybody drinks wine, but I believe that the a Bible has a glass of mind in mind as we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. A master sommelier, someone very gifted in discerning and tasting wine, will take a glass of wine and uh, will swirl it, and will sniff it. I'm into sniffing, by the way. Into sniffing. And will, apparently, and will sip it. Swirl, sniff, and sip. And from that, we'll be able to tell you the variety of the grape. We'll be able to tell you the region by w from where it comes. We'll be able to tell you the vintage or the year. And the most amazing thing is they'll talk about hints. A sommelier will go, Oh, this is a Sauvignon, a Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it's, it's from uh, the region of Napa Valley, 2007. And I'm, I'm picking up a hint of cinnamon. Um, oh, 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 there's also pencil lead. I'm also picking up 
They say things like that. It makes like I'm going to want a, a pencil. Oh, and it's very, very earthy and smoky. So that's what the Master Solomon does. And the idea is God wants you to see yourself like a glass of wine where someone picks you up and they swirl you and they sniff and they sip. And what he wants them to ultimately say is, oh, the variety here is love. Love is the variety. And I'm picking up a hint of joy, a hint of of gentleness. And oh yeah, ooh, 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 there's some there's some self-control in there. The the fruit is love. That's the the variety. And the other the other words are merely hints or define what love is. We see this repeated in a very famous passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Some of you may have not seen this passage since your wedding day when you had it read. It's called the chapter of love. And Paul in his writings is going to say the same thing. Listen to this. Love is the big idea. And then he's going to describe love. These are hints. Look at this again. Love is patient. See, there you are. Patient. Patience is a hint of love. Love is kind. There's another one. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Some say that good wine gets better with age. That may or may not be true, but one thing we know for the follower of Jesus is that as we mature in Christ, we taste better to those around us. Isn't that so cool? You are a glass of wine to be enjoyed by others. Today, I want to talk to you about the first hint of love. It is the subject of joy. Anybody want joy? Let's pray and we'll dive in. Father, we thank you for your word today. And now as we open it up and we look at the truth of this amazing vision that you have for us to become people of joy, I pray that we will set aside all of our distractions and receive what you have for us today so that we can walk out of here today different than when we came in, filled with hope and overflowing with joy. And all those who agreed with it said, Amen. Amen. Today, we're going to focus on the virtue of joy. God wants you to have joy. As a matter of fact, our key verse today from the teachings of Jesus in John chapter 15 states this. It's a passage of scripture, another famous passage of scripture in the context where Jesus, of all things, is talking about the vine and the branches. He's talking about the fruit of the spirit. Here's what the key verse says. Ready? Uh, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus is saying the vision that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have is for the same joy that resides in Jesus is the same joy that resides in you. And it's not to be half full, but it is to be complete. And he's saying that this vision is actually possible if you keep your branch tied in to the vine of Christ. Now, as we study the topic of joy from the Old and the New Testament, we find two dimensions to the concept or the virtue of joy. The first one has to do with the word rejoice. Uh, Rejoicing because of my circumstances. When good things happen to us, A follower of Jesus recognizes that those good things always come from God and we rejoice or we get our praise on, if you will. And so, uh, for example, uh, causes for joy. It is springtime in Kansas City and there is no snow. Can I hear some praise? Yeah, you have no idea how much I'm praising the Lord. For those of you who were not here when I arrived a year ago, it snowed in the springtime the first four out of five Sundays. 
If you ever thought, I think I have made a colossal mistake. <laughs> but this spring is going to be different. And one thing I know today is that today is different. And because of that, I rejoice. <laughs> Another thing that I rejoice about is on Monday and Tuesday, uh, over 50 pastors got together uh, from Kansas City and met with a guy named Dave Ramsey. And we have begun preparing and planning to work together as the one big C church to come alongside of people this fall, not only in the church, but outside of the church to help them understand and apply God's principles on how to manage your time and money so that they might experience the intense freedom that comes from following Jesus and really, really experience joy. Matter of fact, when we were together, we did a little shout out. You'll notice Roseanne and I are on the floor and Scott Jones and Dan and all those guys are there. And in the middle is Dave Ramsey himself. We're, sing we're saying, shouting out, live like no one else. Take a look at this. Live like no one else. Isn't that cause to rejoice? <laughs> Absolutely. Another cause to rejoice is that this Friday and Saturday, this place is going to have another sold out crowd for a conference called Refresh, where people are going to gather together to circle their heart and passion around the orphan, to provide for them a loving Christian family where they can have hope and health and a future, and I'm so excited to be a part of a church that takes serious the command of Jesus through his brother James that we look after the orphans in their need. That gives us cause to rejoice this Friday and Saturday. Amen? Amen. 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 That is super exciting. It's interesting that it is actually, as you might suspect, easy to rejoice because of my circumstances, right? But there are actually quite a number of people that I run into that find it hard to rejoice even in the midst of their circumstances being good, right? You have an Eeyore complex. You know, you always, when something good happens to you, you're always known for saying, yeah, but the other shoe's gonna drop soon. <laughs> and I'm just going to tell you, uh, you, you need to check into that. It's one thing to be a realist. It's another thing not to enter into a season of rejoicing because God has provided for you in this moment in time a good situation, okay? And you don't need to be an extrovert to all, like me. You don't have to like jump up and down and make little kids scared because you're so excited. You can be an introvert that just from the depths of your heart is just whispering how grateful you are to recognize that God has brought in this moment something good into your life, amen? But here's the thing. What Jesus is actually offering is a brand of joy that is actually possible regardless of your circumstances. Regardless of your circumstances. As a matter of fact, we've contained it uh, in our key idea. I'm going to invite you to say it out loud with me, church. Ready? This is what's available to us. Ready? Despite my circumstances... I feel inner contentment and understand my purpose in life. Now, there is a book in the Bible that scholars have, uh, have called a treatise on joy. The whole book is dedicated to the topic of increasing our joy in life. It is the book of Philippians. And the most notable observation about this book being called the treatise on joy is because the author is a guy named Paul who is writing the treatise on joy while he's in prison. This is a huge Observation. There are four chapters in the book, and each chapter gives us an insight on how we can have joy in spite of the current obstacles in our life. Just in these four chapters, Paul is going to use the word joy 16 times. I have counted, as I've read through the book of Philippians, 20 principles on how to increase your joy in this little book. And it's interesting, about half of the principles are taught by Paul. The other Half of the principles are caught by Paul as you observe how he is dealing with his circumstances of being in prison. So what I want to do is give you a taste out of each of these chapters to inspire you to pursue 
the virtue of joy. The first one, chapter one, is how to have joy in spite of my circumstances. Now keep in mind as I read this section of scripture, Paul is in prison, he's under house arrest because of his faith, and he has been sidelined, and I don't know about you, but just being honest, if I were in prison, it would rob me of joy, just saying. I would struggle, right? But not Paul. Now lean in as uh, we read beginning in verse 12 of chapter 1 or page uh, 363 of your belief book. He, He writes, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my change, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Uh, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. What, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Do you want to have joy in spite of your circumstances? Write this first principle down. See your glass as half full. You see, Paul disciplined himself to see things a different way. He was searching for the good in his circumstances, believing that God was writing a good story for his life. Because of his faith, he is sidelined. And because of that, other people who lacked the courage before are now stepping up in great courage to fill in where Paul has been taken out. But not only this, Paul was gaining in popularity at this time, uh, and other preachers and evangelists were jealous because of Paul's rising popularity. And when Paul was quarantined in prison, they got super excited and said, now it's our turn to sort of have our day in the, in the, in the limelight. And I don't know about you, but the average person who would be sidelined for the important work that they were doing would be depressed. Not Paul, because he says, uh, he said, here's the deal. You know, because I am in prison, what's happened is that some people, out of a love for the gospel, have now had the courage to stand up, and it's multiplied my witness. But then there's these other people who are doing it for all the wrong reasons, but nonetheless, they're preaching Christ. I love the phrase, if you're taking notes, underline the words, but what, but what does it matter? If you are a person of joy, you have learned to say the phrase numerous times in a week, but what does that matter? Some of you get tanked in your joy because you let things matter that shouldn't matter. Paul said, but what does it matter that these people are out preaching the gospel, trying to bring me down? Because the reality is Christ is being preached. Instead of just lonely old me preaching the gospel, there's now an army preaching of the gospel, some for good reasons, some for bad reasons, but what does that matter? And then he says at the end of the paragraph, for this I rejoice. Say, but what does this matter? Say it. But what does this matter? Say it again. But what does this matter? I challenge you to use that phrase one day each time this next week. Say to somebody, but what does that even matter? Not going to let that rob me of my joy. All right, the second one is in chapter two. It's joy in spite of my past. For many people, it is their past that robs them of joy today. For many of you, you can't get uh, over your past. Whether this is something that has happened to you or something that you have done. You are buried in your past and it is holding your joy captive. Paul says you've got to learn to put your past in the rear view mirror. Listen to what he says in chapter three. He says, not that I have already obtained all of this, speaking of the goal of pursuing Christ, 
or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, here it is, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Here's the principle. If you want to increase your joy, put your past behind you and focus on the future. I want you to listen to this. Before Paul came to Christ, he was responsible for the murdering of other Christians, particularly in Acts chapter 6 and 7, the murdering of a beautiful, innocent man full of the Spirit by the name of Stephen, stoned to death under Paul's watch. How does one get beyond that kind of a past? Paul says you get beyond it when you receive the forgiveness in Christ. If Christ can forgive you, at some time, you're going to need to learn to forgive yourself. And some of you have never done that. And in order to work through the past, I'm not saying it's easy, uh, many of us have to see a professional counselor that can help us through the long journey of putting our past in the rear view mirror. I love the statement, God can turn your mess, say it with me, into your message. He can do that if you let him. But you can't just put your past behind you. Paul says you also have to strain forward to the future. The image is of a runner. Paul loved the runner's analogy in the Olympics. And the idea is a runner is running with the intent to win the first prize, the first place. And in order to win, he's straining forward. And you've seen runners many times go like this. This is the image that Paul has in mind, that you are so focused on the future, not just the past, but on the future. Someone has wisely said, when your memories become bigger than your dreams, your life is over. One of the mentors in my life, I've mentioned to him, you before, Dr. Howard Hendricks, a professor at the seminary I graduated from, uh, tells a story uh, how uh, he was friends with an older couple and the husband died first, and then the woman, she uh, passed away at the age of 95, 95. And he said he received a call from the woman's daughters who said, Prof Hendricks, he says, uh, we just went into mom's apartment for the first time since she's passed away, and on her desk just a couple of days ago, we found her goals for the next five years. Maybe that's the reason why she lived to the age of 95, because she was straining toward the future. And some of us are not going to make our way out of the 50s because we have nothing planned. Mm, that's good. The next uh, category is joy in spite of other people. People can be the biggest joy robbers of all. And I want to get an amen from you, but I'm going to encourage you, if that person is sitting next to you, don't shout out, okay? Okay? So I'm going to say it, ready? People are the biggest joy robbers of all. Can I get an amen? amen. If the person next to you did not say amen, you might want to check into that. I want you to listen to the advice that Paul gives in Philippians 3, beginning in verse 17. Listen carefully. He says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just, as you, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is not set on earthly things. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven as we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glory, his body. Pastoral moment here. Some of you flat out hang out with the wrong people. Debbie Downers, and they are robbing you of your joy. 
Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't hang out with people who are struggling and hurting because as followers of Jesus, we're committed to come alongside of such people and bring them up. It doesn't mean that you're not supposed to hang out with people who are far from God, who don't know Jesus, because the Bible clearly instructs that followers of Jesus are supposed to rub up and live their faith before those who are outside of Christ so that they may see our good deeds produced from Christ and glorify our fathers in heaven. What we're talking about is your core team the core people that you hang out with. And if I could break counseling confidences, which I can, I would tell you stories even as of today where people are destroying their life primarily because they're hanging around a bunch of losers. I hope the L is in the right way. Is that right? (laughs) Otherwise it's back at me and I'm the loser, right? Is that right? Is that right there? Losers. Losers, right? It's your core team. And I would encourage you that uh, you, you should be able to write the name of the people you have around you that you're looking, as Paul said, that are moving in the same direction as you. And you should even have two or three of those people that are further along than you in their spiritual journey, like Paul was. And if you show that list to me or one of our pastors, you know, would we approve of the kind of people you are putting yourself around to move you into not only a place of, of growing in Christ, but into a place of joy. If you're taking notes, write this one down. Surround yourself with the right people. Surround yourself with the right people. Surround yourself with winners. Now, the final category is joy in spite of my stuff. Joy in spite of my circumstances, joy in spite of my past, joy in spite of other people, and finally, joy in spite of my stuff. This is found in chapter four, and Paul says this about his own experience, beginning in verse 11. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. If you want to increase your joy, write this down, more stuff and money isn't the answer. But I also want you to write this down right next to it. Neither is less money or stuff. Okay? Money and stuff is irrelevant to the quota of joy that you have in your life. I want you to take a look, a closer look at what Paul's saying. He's saying that he has had season in his life where he has been flush with cash. And he's had season in his, seasons in his life where he didn't know where the next meal was coming from. And he says, I have learned the secret of being content in both situations. Most people read this passage and assume that Paul only learned how to learn contentment in the seasons where he had little. That it was easy to be content when he had a lot. But if you look closer to what Paul's saying, he's saying, I've had to learn how to be content in both circumstances. And what we see here is that it is equally challenging to learn contentment when you have a lot as when you don't have a lot at all. The only valid place for your net worth to reside is in Christ. Paul said, I've learned the secret, and the secret is I can do all things. I can rise above all things through Christ who gives me strength. One of the biggest mistakes that people make who have money uh, or people who want money, it's an inordinate obsession with them, is that they're looking to buy things. Okay, And the whole world has gotten us into this. And things are okay. I think the thing is you think about coming into a church that the pastor tells you stuff is bad. Stuff is great. Stuff is great. A good, good father has given you resources to buy stuff, right? He's given you those resources. But here's the problem that most of us have. Uh, God wants us to enjoy the stuff that he's made available for us to purchase. He wants us to enjoy the stuff. The problem is we we put our joy in stuff. What he wants us to do is to put our stuff in our joy. Okay, follow that again. Most of us, where we make the mistake is we put our joy in the stuff that we buy 
as opposed to putting our stuff in the joy that we have in Christ. And if you don't get that right, then stuff will always be a problem for you. A couple years ago, um, I have a friend uh, that sold his business uh, that he started from scratch for $250 million. You can live off of that. I've seen it done. <laughs> and uh, he took me on a trip to Cabo St. Lucas. And some of you have been to Cabo, right? But you haven't been to his neighborhood. And he took me there on his private jet with his two private pilots. And uh, yeah, we were on the ocean. The house right below was Tim Allen. The house next door was Mary Hart from Entertainment Tonight, the founder of Croc Shoes. A couple doors down was Sylvester Stallone. And also a neighbor of mine from San Antonio. His house was just four doors down, a guy named George Strait, country artist. And uh, it was a... Uh, it was an amazing experience, and we were sitting in the hot tub at night. You see in the picture I'm talking about here? Private jet, we're sitting in the hot tub, and uh, I couldn't help it. I said, what is it like to, to be at the top? I mean, just, I'll never be there, but I just want to live vicariously for you for a moment. What is it like? And he said the most interesting thing to me. He said, Randy, what I have discovered through the seasons of earning money, that no matter what stage you get into, even where I'm at, there's always another level. There's always another party you get invited to that you weren't invited to before where you're at the very, very bottom. And so here is my advice to you. Don't keep climbing this ladder because there is no end to it. Find joy and contentment with where you're at now. And if God gives you more, it's just a matter of stewardship of how you use it for other people. And when you get to that place, you'll be able to buy some sort of shiny, nice thing. But it is not the source of your joy. The source of your joy is Jesus Christ. But you're able to enjoy the shiny, nice thing because it doesn't really, at the end of the day, matter that much to you. Come on, that'll preach. Right? But we have also been uh, with our kids numerous times to the Dominican Republic, and we go into the inner uh, places where the Haitians are, uh, are, are doing the sugar canes, and we've taken our kids in there primarily for microfinancing, and, uh, and it's poverty at a level you've just never seen before, and every single time we stop and ask our kids, look around, do the children seem unhappy? And for the most part, their quota of happiness is higher than the wealthy people we find in the States. And Paul is simply telling you that there is not joy in stuff, but rather there is joy in Christ. You can enjoy your stuff only if you put your stuff in the joy you have in Christ. If you flip-flop that around, you're going to forever be miserable, whether you're poor or rich. If I'm going to be miserable, I'd prefer to be rich. Just saying. <laughs> Stories told of a great violinist by the name of Nicolai, Niccolo Paganini. He was performing one night in a concert hall filled with people, the beautiful with the orchestra. And as he's performing, one of the four strings breaks. But he continues on. In his mastery, he continues on. A few moments later, the second string breaks. And he improvises, and they do not stop. He continues to play beautifully. And believe it or not, true story, the, four, the third string breaks, and he is down to one string. And Paganini is able, with his ingenuity and giftedness, to finish this beautiful song on one string. When he finishes, the crowd stands to their feet, erupts in a standing ovation, and Paganini takes his violin, and he says, Paganini and one string. And then he turns to the conductor and he does an encore, beautifully played note for note on one string. Some of you feel like you are down to just one string. But God is saying to you that in Christ, in spite of your circumstances, in spite of your past, in spite of other people, and in spite of your stuff, you can rise above all of that and play a beautiful song. The scriptures is telling you today that you are becoming a beautiful glass of wine where people swirl and people sniff and people sip. And God's vision is that they will say, the variety is love and I am picking up a strong hint 
of joy. And not only will that be good for you, but that will be good for all the people around you. This is God's vision for you. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Please stand to your feet. Look forward to having you back next week. Study the next chapter. We're gonna be talking about the hint of peace. Anybody would like a little peace? Give me some rejoicing. Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to open up the scriptures and give you some surprising insights on the virtue of peace. Now, go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all men. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And thank you, thank you, thank you for celebrating your lead teaching pastor's one-year anniversary. Amen. God bless you guys.